Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, our next man out has spent more than half his life making games. Uh, to him, absolutely everything is a game, or at least could be. Um, let's give a smashing welcome to <laughs> Alex Travers. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear all right? Yes, okay, that's cool. Um, well, yes, uh, my name is uh, Alex Trowers, and uh, thank you very much for having me back at uh, console. It's my second one, and uh, uh, the last one was fun, so I see no reason for this to be any different. It, um, it, it always gives me great pleasure uh, coming to Norway. I'm a big fan, big fan, especially of your slightly salty, slightly sweet uh, confectionery. We like that. Uh, <laughs> Very glad to be here in the home of, you know, fish, potatoes, oil. <laughs> Kicking hats off sticks, and apparently the, uh, the uh, highest rate of one-night stands in Europe. <laughs> hey, how you doing? N nice shoes, like it. It's good. Anyway, right, so, uh, like I said, my name is Alex Trowers. Uh, I am uh, uh, at Bulk Paint on Twitter, if you wish to follow me. I am a designer. Um, uh, with all the various connotations that have. Uh, it's, uh, I guess it's a bit of a, a, a misnomer, a bit of an old school designer. I focus very much on uh, gameplay mechanics, what makes things fun, how you can make things interesting. Um, but I do other things as well. Um, back in the day, you couldn't just do one thing, you kind of did a bit of everything, so I did a bit of a code, a bit of a, an artist as well. But this will be mainly focused on sort of the design aspect of things. So my talk is entitled Making Games is Easy. Um, I find the actual act of creating a game is a very, very simple thing. It can be time consuming, it can be expensive, it can be frustrating, but it is easy. You know if you've got it right. Is that thing you made it, uh, fun? Yes, you got it right. Well done. Getting paid is hard. Uh, you can make the best game in the world, and it can be wonderful, and everyone really likes it. But actually getting any money for this is a really, really tricky thing. Now, again, and the same thing happened last year, um, I have to preface this with the fact that a lot of the stuff you're going to hear, you have already heard today. Uh, the speakers that come on before me have already torpedoed my talk by mentioning a lot of things that I wanted to mention. But uh, we'll change a few things up and, and see how it goes. Okay, so. If you're going to make a game, the first thing that most people will start with is the idea. Um, uh, I often do these talks, and I often start it with this, but the amount of times that when people find out what it is that I do, uh, they immediately come up and say, I've got a great idea for a game. So in fact, quick show of hands, how many of you have got a great idea for a game? Look at that. OK, now, honestly now, keep your hands up, honestly now, Keep your hands up if your great idea for a game isn't just the story behind it, or the, who the character is, or what it is that they're going to do, or the setting. Your great idea for the game is actually what you do and how you do it. Because everyone comes up to me, you all think, no, 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 right, this the lies, lies. I'm going to speak to you guys later. You're going to come up and you're going to say, I've got an idea for a game, and you're going to tell me a story. You'll be amazed how many times it happens. So once you've got this idea and you know what it is that you actually want to make, um, how do you go about doing it? Well, actually, one very important thing is your idea is not that important. It really, really isn't. Okay. More important than the idea itself is how you can make that idea real. You can, you can have this fantastic idea, uh, but it will be let down by a poor implementation. Or you can have a mediocre idea, and you can iterate on it and polish it and refine it to such a level that everyone thinks it's absolutely magnificent. Magnificent. So yes, the most important thing is the execution of it. What you, what you are going to need to make this game of yours, there are a series of things that everyone will need. Now, obviously, I'm assuming that you're going to be making a computer game. Uh, as opposed to a board game, or a card game, or a word game, or anything like that. You're going to be making a game that is played on a computer of some description. Um, so obviously you're going to need hardware, you're going to need a computer, you're going to need software, you're going to need the tools to actually create the stuff. 
Um, you're going to need, well, some ability. If you don't have the ability yourself, you're going to need to partner up with people who have the correct skill sets and make a team that has the collective ability to produce this game. All of these things are very, very, very obvious. You're going to need determination. Um, I keep saying it's easy, but it is, it, and it can be, a long and trying process. And if you don't have the determinism and the, the determination and the enthusiasm to see your idea through, well, no one else is going to do it for you. Yeah? Um, if you're running a, a, a team of people, uh, they're going to be looking to you for inspiration, for, for the drive, the motivation to just carry on going when, believe you me, you can end up in a really rough patch where it's like everyone's like, oh, we're sick to the death of this game, why can't we just finish it? So determination, very, very important. With all that in mind, I often say it has never been easier to make a game, a computer game, than now. So way back in the day, you could buy a computer, and it would come with all the software you needed, everything you needed to make a game. So you could go and make a game on your own. But then at the end of the day, you would have a game, and there's nothing you could do with it. You, who else is going to play it? You could invite your friends around, maybe even make them a copy and, and hand it out to them, but that's it. Then PCs get bigger, more powerful, uh, consoles start appearing. The amount of resources you need to make a game makes it prohibitive. You can no longer just buy a machine and have everything you need. You've now got to buy the machine. You've now got to buy the license for whatever it is you're going to develop on. You now need a team of 50, 100, 150 people to actually make this game. And then when you've done it, you still need to sell the thing. And there's still nothing available to you to sell the thing. You need to go and get a publishing deal. And that's really, really hard stuff. Now, we've kind of come full circle. You can go and buy uh, a computer off the shelf, and for free, you can get all of the tools that you need to make a game. Um, so it's kind of like where we were back at the start. Except now, you can also do something with it. There are many, many, many channels open for you to take this game of yours and push it out to the public, get it into the public domain. So there's no reason, in theory, why you can't start taking money for this wonderful game that you've created. The making the game bit is the easy bit. So now what I'm going to do is, at the risk of kind of bringing it all on a bit of a downer, is talk about uh, uh, a bunch of things, a bunch of reasons why you're not going to get paid. Now, I actually, so uh, does anybody here play uh, League of Legends? Yeah? Okay. League of Legends is an interesting game. I mean, it, it, it's cited as a good example of a certain... Uh, method of monetization, it's cited as a good example of an eSport. But for me, uh, the bit I'd like you to think about is, when you sit down to have a game of League of Legends, there are a number of things that have to go right for you to have a good game. And if any one of them goes wrong, you're not going to have a good game. So bear that in mind as we go through these next features. If any one of these features on its own is enough reason why you're not going to make any money, at making this game of yours. So let's assume you've made a game, okay? What if you can't afford to make it? So you, this is, you, you're dead in the water before you've even started. Um, it has been alluded to today, that again, you know, it's dead easy when you're, if you're a student, you're living at home, you're doing stuff like that, you're eating noodles, and you're doing it in your spare time. Maybe you're not paying rent, Maybe your, your meals are getting provided for you. And you're doing it as a hobby. You're doing it uh, in your spare time, and you might come up with something decent. But for most of us, the real world kind of gets in the way. And you know what? You'll have a day job, which detracts from time you can actually spend making the, making the game. Uh, if you are particularly ambitious, and the game that you want to make is a large AAA title, well, how are you going to get funding for this team of yours. It costs an awful lot of money to run a team of several people, with enough, uh, to run enough people to make a AAA game. It, 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 it's obscene the amount of money it costs. So, again, we're taking on a bit of a downer. You might not even be able to get started with this thing. But let's say we get past that. Say, say we're just making a small game, it's fine. Hmm. Your game might not actually be very good. Uh, now, I am sure you're all brilliant at this, okay? Uh, however, you are also the worst judge of whether or not you are brilliant at this. Um, whenever you're making a game, whenever you're putting your, uh, your heart and your soul into it, oh, no, look, I've got this great idea. 
uh, it's going to be fantastic. There's going to be this thing, and you do the jumping thing, and you're squishing these guys, and they're exploding, and all sorts of stuff. It's going to be fantastic. It is, because it's in your head, and you can see all of the possibilities, and you overlook all of the flaws of the game because you're too close, because you don't want to believe that what you've actually created isn't any good. Um, and it's only when you show it to someone else, and someone opi whose opinion you trust, and they go, oh, I, I, I don't like this, I don't like this for these reasons. And those are all the things that, just because you've been too close to it for too long, you can't pick up on. It is impossible for you to do it. It's very, very hard to remain objective about something that is your own creation, something that... Um, that you love, you love. So your game might not actually be very good, so you're not going to make any money on it. Sorry. But let's assume that it is good, and that you've done all of these other, you've followed all of these other talks, you've been to all of the classes, and you're a good designer, you've got a really good team together, you've got the technology, and you've made a brilliant game. Okay. Be the best or be first. So everything I just said there about your game not being very good, sometimes it doesn't matter. If you're the first person out with this game, that's okay. No one's got anything else to judge it on. So if you're making, I don't know, if you're making a game about racing reindeer, <laughs> has that been done? Has anyone seen that? There's probably a racing reindeer game. Okay, uh, racing giant pandas. I'm fairly sure there hasn't been a racing giant pandas game. Yeah. Or, okay, let's have something else. Let's go uh, uh, snails with, with uh, machine guns. Snails with machine guns on the shelves? Worms. Well, those are worms. Those are worms. They don't have shells. Okay. All right. Let's think of something else. Right. Give me uh, an animal. Weasel. A weasel. All right. We like weasel. Give me an emotion. Sad. Sad weasel. <laughs> so it's a game about a sad weasel. And what's he going to do? Kill. Sad weasel kill. <laughs> Or you kill the sad weasels. Okay, so we've got a weasel who's sad, and either he's killing things or some things are killing him. That's our genre. That's our game that we're going to make. Please tell me there isn't one of those on the market. I don't think there is. So, we could make that game, we could rush it out, we could be first, and therefore, by the standard set in Sad Weasel Killer, we are the best. If someone else has already done Sad Weasel Killer, and we are... Not necessarily copying, because we were doing it in parallel. We weren't cribbing off them or anything. We're just unfortunate that Sad Weasel Death Machine has come out before our game. We have to be better than them. Okay, that's just an aside to that. So yeah, be first or be the first. This one, this one sentence here, was entirely covered by Emmy's talk earlier. Okay, the marketing stuff. Everything she said in there was absolute gold dust, absolutely right. You can have the best game in the world, but if people haven't heard of you, you're not going to, you're not going to sell anything. Um, there was often, we always made a distinction between uh, marketing and PR. Uh, the distinction being that marketing was something you always paid for, PR was something that you did for free. So uh, these days, I think that distinction is getting blurred, and you can't afford to not do both. You always need to have a public presence through whatever form, through as many forms as you can, that is saying, hey, guys, look, I've got this game about weasels and death. You really need to play it. Okay, let me show you, and this is amazing, this is amazing for these reasons. You get the weasel, we've got all the proper fur on him, look at his little eyes light up when he starts killing things, he's got a gun, now he's got a sword, a hammer, right? You need all of that stuff, and that needs to be constant. It needs to be this constant, constant thing around the time of your game's launch, um, so that people are aware, and whenever they just start thinking weasel, the first thing they think of is your weasel killer game, all right? Um, it is a lot of work. So you saw, you saw her slide there with the, the, the five things that you absolutely must have. Um, and she also made the point that more often than not, you will actually outsource them to other people simply because it is that much work. And while you're near the end of your development cycle and you're slaving away on this magnum opus of yours, you just think you won't have time. And again, Jury, you've, you've come up against this many, many times, I'm, I'm sure, where you'll get a phone call and it's like, yeah, we've got three weeks until alpha and we need, need to put some sound in. Um, so can you just knock us up some stuff in, in three weeks? By the way, you've got a Meg. Uh, and it's like, it's an afterthought. There's a project that's not like 
Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so there's a load of things that... The earlier you start thinking about this, the earlier you start budgeting for this, the absolute better. And the earlier you start it, the better. You don't necessarily have to go public straight away, but the earlier you start planning for this, the better. So yeah, so if no one has heard of your game, <coughs> um, well, you're not going to sell a damn thing. Because they won't know to buy it. No interest in the subject. Now, this kind of... This kind of feeds back into the, it's very hard to be objective about your own stuff. Um, there was a kid in uh, Teesside who came up to me and pitched this wonderfully researched, this real, some lavish attention to detail in this thing. It was a subject he was really, really passionate about. It was... Um, and you could see that, like I said, he'd done all the research, he'd gathered all the materials together. It was something he, he did in his, his spare time. Uh, it was a, a Napoleonic conflict. There is some interest in Napoleonic conflicts. Are you going to make a lot of money making a Napoleonic conflict game? Possibly not. Uh, show of hands, who's interested in the Napoleonic Wars? A few hands. Who is interested in a weasel with a machine gun? There. Right. Okay. So, given that choice, which game do you make? Okay. So, I, and again, so this guy, he'd done everything. He knew he had all of these fusiliers and all of the, what the different garb meant, and they had hats, and the, which angle of feather was at, and how many medals they had, and the guns, and how the guns would work accurately, and smoke, and he lavished so much love and attention onto this in a subject he cared deeply about. And to, he would have a 100% take-up rate from all Napoleonic War fans. Absolutely. Every single Napoleonic fan would buy that. However, Napoleonic War fans, this many. Killer Death Weasel fans, this many. You see what I mean? So you'd have 100% of not very much, or you could have 30% of a great number, and you'd still do better off that way around. So yeah, be very... Uh, be very open to the idea that just because you're interested in it, it doesn't necessarily mean other people are going to be. I hope it's wrong. I hope, you know, or, or your passion and your drive can convert people to suddenly thinking, well, okay, yeah, yeah, no, maybe Napoleon had a point. Maybe, that, maybe I should look more into that. That could be interesting. But that is quite tricky to do. The 800-pound gorilla. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of phrase we use to indicate that, you know what, everything else, right, so all of those other things has gone fine. We're going to be the first, brilliant. Uh, we've made a good game, we've, we can afford to make it, everything's in place. It's a subject people are interested in, the marketing's out there, this is it, we're good. And then along comes the 800 pound gorilla and goes, no, no, look at me instead, okay? Case in point. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was working for a company called uh, BlackRock. It was a Disney company based in Brighton. Uh, we made a game called Split Second. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah? It's an action racing game. Uh, it features stunning visuals, explosions. At one point, we literally crash a 747 on top of the racetrack. And you're trying to dodge the engines as they're coming at you as this plane's exploding and someone else is ramming you into the... It's quite a, a, a spectacular visual feast. Um, production values coming out the wazoo. You will not find a game that is shinier than this one. It sold terribly. The reason it sold terribly is because we released one week before Red Dead Redemption. Okay? Red Dead Redemption is an 800 pound gorilla. FIFA is an 800 pound gorilla. Halo is an 800 pound gorilla. Grand Theft Auto, 800 pound gorilla. If you release anywhere around some time where they've announced that maybe they're going to release, you're not going to sell any units. Um, now, some people in their infinite wisdom said, it doesn't matter, it's a completely different game. And yes, it is. This is riding horses in the out west. Ours is crashing planes into cars and stuff. They should be totally different games. But the reality of it was that with a limited budget, uh, people can buy one game a month, one AAA box game a month. Um, and they knew that was coming out, so they didn't spend their money here, they spent their money there. I also feel sorry for Blur, which was a very similar game that came out two weeks after us, so one week after Red Dead. Um, so we were first. Um, so even if they were better than us, they still had to do with the fact that we beat them out, and we kind of looked better, um, and they had an 800 pound gorilla as well. So never, never go up against these guys. It will take 
more resources than you can ever possibly imagine to go up against these guys. Like, Gran Turismo 5 won't go up against Forza. And vice versa. They just know not to do it because it's going to distract from them. And those are, those are two games at the top of, their, top of their craft. Absolutely the top of their craft. But they won't go head to head. So yeah, 800 pound gorilla. And frustratingly, you don't have any control over this gorilla. So it can just be bad luck. People are dicks. <laughs> I'm thinking this, this whole thing could just be, this is going to be my next talk. I could probably do an entire talk on the subject that people are, in fact, dicks. If you analyse uh, a lot of the situations that you find yourself in, in just in the everyday life, you will think that we wouldn't be here if people weren't just dicks. So, in a perfect world, um, I would make a game, and I would ask you guys, hey, just pay me what you think this game is worth. And I would be able to, if I'd done a good enough job with the game, which we're going to assume that, you know, everyone can make a good game, we're going to assume that that's the case, then you would give me enough money so that I could live comfortably on. And this isn't me going, but I really want that Lamborghini, because that would be me being a dick. Okay? I, I want more money than this game is worth. That's me being a dick. And it isn't you going, well, because I can take it for free, I'm going to take it for free. I don't have to. You're saying I don't have to give you any money for it. Well, I'll have it for nothing then. That's you being dicks. Uh, and if you go back to the old retail model, so here is a game, you pay a set price for that game. Piracy is people being dicks. And because of that, you get into this... I don't like where this analogy is going. You get into this sort of dick arms race, <laughs> whereby, because the pirates are refusing to pay for the retail copies, the publishers, who are now making no money on these retail copies because everyone's playing the pirated ones, have to come up with methods to counter them. So they'll come up with copy protection, which all these people over here, some of whom are being dicks, are going, well, that's a bit of a dick move. Now well, I've got to have this stupid manual or a lens lock or a CD key or it's got to phone home and online DRM. All of that stuff, all of stuff which, as a consumer, we hate and we think it's the publishers being dicks. And it is, but they're only doing that because you were a dick in the first place. Yeah? There was a, uh, it was a fascinating analogy. Has, any, has anyone heard of a game called Game Dev Story? Yeah. So there was a, a PC version of it recently. Well, not a version of it. There was a PC, I don't want to use the term rip-off. Someone had taken Kairosoft's original idea, uh, which, to be honest, is just a reskin of all their other games that they've made up to this point. Uh, and they'd made a PC version where it's a simulated game development environment. Um, so you had started up a game development company, you would hire all the people, you'd put them in their little desks, you'd come up with a game idea that they're going to make, and they would little bars would fill up, little coins fly out of their heads, and you make the game and you release the game, and hopefully you make a bit of money as, as the game developer and you start winning awards for your games and so on. Lovely little game, lovely little idea. Um, and what the developers had done is they had voluntarily released a version up on the torrent sites, a hacked version up on the torrent sites that people could download for free, alongside the one that they could pay for from their own website. But in the one that they spawned for free, they ramped up the level of piracy in the game so that it was impossible for you to complete the game or do well in the game because you would get crippled by piracy. <laughs> what do you think happened next? Well, the first thing these people, these pirates, started doing was asking the developers, is there any way I can introduce DRM to stop these pirates in my game? <laughs> Taking... uh... <laughs> that was their first recourse. So you see what I mean? There's this arms race of, okay, so you were a bit of a dick, but look, I'm going to trump you with this one. So life would just be so much easier if people weren't dicks. Unfortunately, that isn't the case, and um, I can't see that ever changing anytime soon, so I'm not entirely sure what you do about it. I think the only thing you can do is... Uh, do your best job and try not to perpetuate the dickishness. So, you know, hey kids, be cool, don't pirate stuff. Yeah, yeah, that, this is what I'm saying. Uh, before they invented games, people have always been dicks. And there are many systems in life that will work perfectly if it wasn't for the human element. Anyway. <laughs> 
You can, come and find me later. We'll, we'll chat more about how I think people are just, well, idiots. <laughs> okay, so what can you do? What can you do to hopefully avoid all of those nasty things? Like I said, any one of those things might be enough to torpedo your game and mean that you're not going to make any money for it. And as you can see, so many of them aren't your fault. Yeah? Um, it's your fault if you didn't make a good game. You've got to hold your hand up to that. It's your fault if no one's heard of it, because as Emmy has shown you, there are so many things you can and should be doing to make sure that people have heard of it. The other ones, there's not really much you can do about it. No interest in subject, yeah, that's your fault. Um, again, you were too close to it. The 800 pound gorilla, there's nothing you can do about that, I'm afraid. Suck it up, it might happen, um, and people are always going to be dicks. But what, can, what else can you do? What, how can you help to try and stave that off? The first one is plan ahead, obviously. You make a plan and you stick to it. Now, in game development, um, especially if you want to make... I, I, I find that the, the very best games are the more emergent ones, the, the ones where the gameplay has evolved, it has come out of the act of playing it, and people going, oh, I think it, if it just did this, and hey, wouldn't it be cool if that, and what about this? As opposed to somebody sitting in an office going, right, I'm going to write a document that is going to tell us how to make this game go... This is what the game is, let's make that. You, sir, Mr. Programmer, implement that. Those games suck. They suck because they run into problems that you will never, you would never be able to foresee at the I'm typing up the game design stage. You'll never get that. Uh, you could be the best designer in the world, you will never be able to think of everything. They'll suck because it's just one person doing it. Because it's just one guy going, and the game is this. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, I have a very, very strong feelings about the fact that you should never design a game by committee. If there's a bunch of you getting involved in it, uh, and one person says, well, it should be red, and one person says, well, it should be blue, the very last thing you should do is make it magenta. Don't do that, <laughs> right? Ask any artist, they will slap you. So one person has to make the call. It could be red, it could be blue, it could be somewhere between the two, but don't just de facto go half of that, half of that, here we are. Yeah, compromise, horrible word in game design. That person is a dick <laughs> if they just ignore what everyone else is saying. Okay? These people are saying it for a reason. They firmly believe that it would be better if the game did this. And... If you're in the position of leading the project, you are a, you're a fool if you don't listen to them. It doesn't mean to say that you have to act on everything that everyone says, but you need to collate the information that they're giving you, put it all together, weigh up the pros and cons of every single thing that everyone has told you evenly, and decide on a course of action. <coughs> Do your research. And I don't mean, hey, Mr. Napoleonic Wars guy, let me just have my own little fantasy about the battle of whenever and being stuck in a tent with syphilis or something. Um, do your research. This can help mitigate the 800-pound gorilla. If someone has already done a press release saying Grand Theft Auto 6 is coming out next week, don't release your game next week. Okay? Uh, do your research. Find out what sort of things people are interested in. We've missed the Nazi train, we've missed the zombie train is probably coming to an end, would you say? If it's going to take you a year to make a game, probably don't make a game with zombies in it now, they're not going to be popular in a year, because everyone's fed up with it. The Western thing came and went, what's going to be the next one? What, what do you think is going to be the next game? You could be going in, researching it, looking up this sort of stuff, getting a run on the competition. Yeah, um, Very, very important. It's also very, very important that doing your research also implies that when you come to the phase where you're trying to get money for it, when you're trying to source funding for the studio, you're going to find all of this out tomorrow when we do the Dragon's Den thing. But if you stand up in front of someone who has potentially got the money that you need, and they ask you the question, well, how much is it going to cost? And you go, oh, I, I didn't think that far ahead. Um, three? You're not going to get the money. Okay? Do your research also implies you've planned it, you should therefore know how much it costs. You should also have an idea of how much it's going to make based on your research. Well, this game was pretty similar, and they did this many units on this platform. We're on the same platform, a similar sort of thing, so we can estimate maybe this. Extrapolate that out. Yeah, research, research, research. Quite important. But yes, you should also 
you know, when you come to the pitching thing, have an answer. Um, obviously, I didn't understand that slide that was up there earlier that was all written in Norwegian, but one of them seemed to be there was a contingency thing, plan B, being flexible, being able to think on your feet, all of the stuff that Nils was saying, yes, 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 yes. Uh, and also, again, I didn't, I didn't uh, understand all of your pitch, but there was a point where you kind of, you were shuffling along doing that, and that was you telling them, don't do this, yeah? Yeah, brilliant. All of the stuff that Nils was saying, <laughs> yes, bang on, thank you again for torpedoing some of my talk. Um, yeah, so have answers for things, be prepared to think on your feet, be confident, be passionate. This is my idea, you're going to love it for these reasons. Just wait for this. So, research and pitching. Be flexible. I just said that, man. See how I, I wasn't flexible there. Have a vision. Um, oh dear, that's going to bite me, isn't it? Yeah, so, it's very easy, and this kind of feeds back into the have the plan, have the, 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 the drive, the determination. It's very easy to lose sight of the vision. When you start the game, and it is the idea, the inception, that the embryo of a, hey, wouldn't it be cool if... You don't really know where you're going to go, but you know you're going in that direction. Okay? But that's your vision. You've got this final thing that you're aiming for, and it's over there, and it might be a bit misty, but we know what it is. And then someone else will come over and say, this. And you'll be like, ooh, okay, so now we're looking over here. And this could be a thing. And then someone else will say, but, but wouldn't it be cool if that thing? And then you find yourself going in this direction. And you're like, well, I'm getting further away from that thing, but I, I like what's going on over here. And if I draw a circle on the ground here, and I stand in the middle of it, and that represents the start of the idea, and the circle represents finishing the game and getting it released. If I walk over here and then change my mind and walk over here, and then change my mind and maybe go over here a bit, I'm never going to get to the edge of, edge of the circle. And I may find loads and loads of cool places within the circle, but I'll never get to the edge of it, and I'll never release the thing, because we've just been going round and round and round, exploring all these different things that we could do. So somebody, the team, needs to have a clear vision that you don't stick to through thick or thin, but you know this is where we want to go. And by all means, kind of wander off there a bit and wander off there a bit, but be heading in that direction. Yeah? Otherwise, you're never going to finish anything. And if you don't finish it, you're not going to get paid. Unless you do a, a, a notch. <laughs> Anyway, as with all these things, there are always exceptions. And how we did that is, uh, here, give me money. It isn't finished, and it may never be, but give me money. Okay. Right. Um, quite a short thing, because I am a designer and I'm all about the gameplay. And it's very easy for me to stand up here and waffle on about this sort of stuff. But one of the key things is to know your audience. And I don't know you guys. I don't know what it is that you do. I don't know what it is that you want to know. So this is the bit where you can tell me what it is that you want to know, and hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions or give you some idea. So this is the interactive part, um, where you're, gonna, you're only going to get out of this as much as you ask me, okay? So yes, questions. Where's your badge? I know. What the hell? <clears throat> um, would it be possible to say that it's, uh, making games isn't easy? It's simple, but not easy. Um, you c yeah, you could argue that. You, could argue you only that. have to do this and this and this to make a game. But actually doing that stuff isn't actually easy, it's not, it's not a breeze. You know? I, I would say, I'd say as long as you've got, again, as long as you've got all of the right stuff, so you've got the right hardware, you've got the right software, the right ability set, i.e. you and the, the correct bunch of people, then the actual act of doing it is easy. Doing your first one, there is nothing harder than shipping your first game. That, that bit's quite tricky. Once you've done it once, it, it does get easier, it, it does get simpler, but the, har uh, the hardest bit is the get that first one out the door. And once you've done that first one, yeah, the act of making a game is easy. We could make a game right here, right now. Uh, it'd be simple. Nobody would give us any money for it. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, Dexter from Jack and Dexter is a sad weasel with weapons. Oh, man. Your idea was rubbish, man. They beat us to it. And they did a pretty good job on it as well, didn't they?
All right, no, no, weasels are off the table then. We can't do that. Uh, well, no, that's not true. We can do it, but we've got to beat Jack and Dexter. Uh, Jack and Dexter in that platforming genre, 800 pound gorilla, maybe 600 pounds, but it's still a big damn gorilla. Yeah. The dude, the dude weasel. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I wanted if you could uh, talk a bit about um, how how you, to become a game designer because it isn't just a field you usually go into. It's you can be a game designer. You can come from programming background. Or you can come from an art background. So it's a, it's a good question. Um, my glib throwaway response would be that everyone thinks they're a game designer anyway. So, um, but no, no, in reality, uh, game design is it's a skill set. It is a different skill set to uh, programming, to, to, to art. Um, the simplest way of becoming a game designer is study. Uh, thankfully, it's not dull, boring, let's go look through books. In fact, you will never be a game designer if all you do is read books on game design. Yeah, um, the only way you can study these things properly is to go out there and actually play the games, and that is you yourself play them. Not just oh, I'm gonna. That guy wrote a blog post on that game, and so I'll, I'll get his opinion of it. Right, my opinion is now his opinion. Uh, that doesn't work. You've got to feel it for yourself. It's about the tactile. It's about the hands-on. That system worked. Why did that work? What did that make me feel? How did that make me enjoy it? So there was a question, the, the question that went to uh, Jury earlier about you can't just listen to sounds anymore. You're always listening to sounds. And if you ask any film critic, they don't enjoy films anymore because they're just there watching the films looking for the, ah, he used this particular trope or that particular lens or this particular style of lighting. As a game designer, it's quite hard to now just play games and switch off and just, oh, I'm enjoying this game because you're always thinking... Why do they do the controls like that? Or, I wonder if they'll put a special pickup around this court. Oh, yeah, there you go. You know, <laughs> and you find yourself kind of, not breaking the games, but spoiling it for yourself because you're always analysing it. But it's that analysis that gives you the very, very strong basis for having a good career in game design. In my opinion, uh, the best game designers are the ones where any member of the team can come up and say, hey, how should this work? And they can immediately go, Right, well, this is the system I think we should implement, and we should implement the system for these reasons. Chief of which is, they did it in that game and it was really good. That's always a good place to start, right? And the only reason you know they did it in that game is because you played it. So that's how you're able to say, this is how their system worked, but what we're going to do is we're going to tweak it with maybe a bit from this system from over this game. I like the way that they did that from that one, and we're going to move them all together and make it our own thing. Don't just go copying other people's games. Anyone can do that. You're not a game designer then. But that's how you make it your own. It's a good place to start. Um, but yes, in short, play games. Hee-hee. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Um, Hello. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm uh, part of uh, Dragon's Den tomorrow, and I've asked <laughs> a couple of uh, people this, uh, this question, but uh, I'm trying to decide uh, whether I should ask for uh, realistic funding in comparison to what my own abilities are, or if I should aim as high as I possibly think I can do. Like, what would you personally uh, recommend? Well, see, right there, um, I have another point about there's gameplay in everything. And there's gameplay in your pitch. You have a choice to make. There is a point here where you're asking for too little money. Uh, it will physically not be possible for you to get the game done with that amount of money. There's a point here where you're asking for too much money. And the dragons will go, we're not going to invest that much money. You're, we don't think that you're going to see enough return to make us our money back. So there's a point somewhere here which is the right amount. I don't know where that is. Um, but there are several things to think of, uh, and this all comes down to sort of the more production side of the, the, the business, the planning ahead, the scheduling, the working it all out. Uh, as generally, generally, what you'll do is you'll say, you'll break everything that you need to do down into tasks. You will work out how many, who's going to do the task and how long it's going to take them. You'll then see how long everyone is working for, You'll come up with a figure for that man month, 
And depending on how many months the project's going to take, which you know because you've just spec'd it all out, you will then be able to say, so therefore it will cost us this much money. Okay? Then you need to add some stuff to that amount uh, because it's never going to go as simply as that. All right? So, I don't know, think of a number, then double it. Right? Um, but yeah, so you will always have to hedge. There will always be, you'll always be asking for more money than is your bargain basement for uh, being able to complete it. And anybody, any investor you go to will know that that's what you're doing, so they're always going to be offering you less or trying to take more of your company, or, and that's where the negotiation starts. And hopefully, the figure you end up at is enough for you to finish the game with a bit of contingency in there and not, get, uh, not hand over your entire life to the investor. Um, but it is, it, there's, no, uh, the, there's no easy way of doing it. It is a lot of touch and feel. Now, again, you can mitigate a lot, a lot of the uh, uh, expenses. So uh, you're familiar with the way Kickstarter works. So they always ask for, this is the bare minimum we need to start this project. Then they have these stretch goals. Uh, and if people give them more money, then they're able to start implementing these other features. That's a brilliant way of doing it. So come up with loads and loads of features, and then boil everything down to what we would call the MVP, the minimum viable product. That is, this is the game that if push came to shove, we would be happy to release this. We really want to do all this other stuff as well, but we would be happy to do this. And as long as that bare minimum reaches your desired bar of quality, desired feature set, then that's how much money you can get and you're fine. If you get more money, add more things. Polish the existing thing. Yeah. It was also, sorry, uh, when you are coming up with these uh, fantastic ideas as well, one of the things that is going to torpedo you is ambition. Everyone is really, really uh, enthusiastic about, and the, you know what, and this game is going to be able to simulate everything. There's going to be water, there's going to be sharks in the water, and they're all going to be real motion sharks, and you're going to be able to break off the tails of the sharks and attach it to the helicopters that we've got that can fly into space and go to a different galaxy, and it's like, yeah, you can't make that game. Um, so again, start small, get a solid foundation, layer on the extra stuff as you get the extra funding. <laughs> and he can't make that game. <laughs> it's a question about uh, becoming a game designer, or rather. Uh, uh, in my experience, of course, playing games is really important, but uh, to test your, ex your own uh, opinions, on, uh, you have to test them on others, like making a few games. It uh, doesn't need, even need to be digital, uh, in my opinion, like making, make a board <coughs> game, make a role-playing game, any game system that somebody else can use without you actually running it. Uh, and you can observe them, is in my experience, like a good exercise in game design. Absolutely, yeah. I wonder whether you have done any uh, like uh, non-digital design of games before you ever became a, di a digital game designer. Have you signed up to my workshop tomorrow? And Not you yet. will see all of the non-digital game design you will ever need. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I started out uh, uh, in games. I firmly blame my father for this. Uh, we lived in a very small space. There was me, my father, and my brother. And to avoid just falling over each other, we used to sit down and we used to just make board games so we could just play them together. So, yeah, so long before we ever had a computer, we were cutting up bits of serial packets to make counters to, to do all our own diff different sort of game types. We had war games, we had driving games. We, had, we, made, we managed to make a platform game uh, just out of bits of card. But it, it wasn't 3D and you're just hopping around on the board. And Weird Paper Scissors Stone game where one person would be chasing the other guy who was chasing this guy who was chasing you. So you wanted to get close to him but avoid him. But everyone's... Yeah, so lo loads of loads and loads and loads of... Uh, uh, non-digital games. I love non-digital games, and I think they get a really, really sort of bad rep because it's always the, the the nerd in the smelly room who doesn't want to see natural sunlight or anything like that, and is just there playing D and D with his friends or whatever. But there is there is nothing you can't do. The only the only restriction on a pen and paper game is you can't simulate real world physics. What you have to do is you have to constantly come up with an abstract for the thing that you want to simulate from the real world. And whether that is, you know, this guy moves this many spaces, or this guy can't move in that direction because gravity, or whatever. You have to think of different ways of, of jumping past the whole chunk of code that would be, well, what's the force applied to this? And now how does it, what's the torque? How does it rotate? How does it collide? Yeah, That's the only, that's the only difference between the two. Yeah, of course, I got excited when you talk about the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And of course, um, for many hardcore or core gamers, these niche games, they sell really well for a small group. And as the market has sort of expanded, you have a lot more casual gamers, but you have also got these dedicated niche gamers that will pay almost anything. And if you look at the Kickstarter projects for niche games, people are throwing money at them. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it goes back to the basic, do the research and estimate the market. But um, um, it is interesting now, as it, uh, the market has uh, expanded, that you know can actually go with these uh, hardcore uh, games as well. Um, have you got any thoughts about um, Success stories and, and on how the balance goes there. Well, so I think the, I think the key thing there is the fact that because we're no longer at the behest of publishers. If you walked into a publisher and said, "I want to do a Napoleonic game," you wouldn't even get to sit down. And a few years ago, you would have to walk into a publisher and say, I want to do a Napoleonic game because there's no other way you could do it. And they just wouldn't let you do it. Now, because people can just do it and then try and sell it afterwards to prove those stupid publishers wrong that, yes, yeah, I told you Napoleonic games would sell. Um, so now you can do that. And it is absolutely fine to aim at the hardcore, provided there are enough of them to give you the return that you would have got. Like I said, if 100% if of their user base buys your game and that user base is big enough to fund your game, then by all means, fill your boots. You know, it's a great idea. But you, the only thing, as I'm saying, is you've got to be careful that not everyone is into the same subject matter as you are. Also, one real, real big problem that you could find yourself in is if you've got core gamers over here, now that, by that I mean the people who are really into your idea really would be your target demographic. And you're looking over here and there's the the casual demographic, the, 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 the people who play Facebook games, the people who play social games. This is a huge number, a monumental number, right? And you start looking at that thinking, well, how do we get them here? Or how do we make a game that encompasses both of those? That's very dangerous, because normally what happens is your game ends up here and doesn't get either of them, yeah? So I would say it's okay to make a, a hardcore game, provided the numbers work. And it's OK to make a casual game, provided the numbers work. But pick a lane. Don't try and do, again, it, it's not, it's red, it's blue, don't go purple. Yeah? <laughs> All right, so I have a question about the uh, be first or be best. Yes. So I'm curious, as you have, be first or be best, fine, it, I can go with that. But if the game is, OK, say we take a game based of Sork, 20, 30 years ago-ish. Based of what, sorry? Sork. Uh, uh, oh, Zork, yes, yeah. okay, yeah. Is it really compared to it? If, it's, if the game is so old that people want a new one, and it doesn't need to be better, does it? And it's not new. It would be nice if it was better. <laughs> um, yeah, so everything's kind of cyclical. Like I said, it's only a matter of time before World War II comes back around again, or zombies come back around again, or ninjas, or Nazis, or whatever. Um, it's why you see that, that very question, it's a brilliant question, that very question is why you see the phrase spiritual successor bandied around so many times. We've had a spiritual successor to XCOM, and actually they managed to call it XCOM. There's a spiritual successor to Homeworld. There's a spiritual successor to Total Annihilation. There's one for Dungeon Keeper. There's one for almost any game that you've got a fond nostalgia for coming out now. So yes, absolutely, that market is there. You're running a very fine line because people already have... You're not coming to them fresh. People, the people who are going to be interested in this have very, very set opinions of why they liked it in the first place. And if your game deviates from why they... Th think they remember why they liked it in the first place, you're just going to annoy them. And you're not, going to, not necessarily going to pick up new people. That's why it still has to be better than what the old one was. Um, but better is very, very subjective in this case. Does that, does that answer your question? Do you? Yeah? Okay. Anyone else? Hello again. Hello again. Um, <laughs> uh, I was just wondering also, uh, you just mentioned it quickly earlier. Uh, it's the thing I've been wondering about. What is the normal thing to um, uh, uh, kind of reward the investors with? Is it like a percentage of whatever you make? Is it a 
percentage of your company? Or? Sales. Sales. Cold, hard cash. Um, that, that's what they're interested in. Now, uh, a percentage of your company is only interested in, only interesting to them if your company is going to be successful and they are going to make money on their return when they come to sell their section in your company. Um, if you're giving them dividends, if you're giving them whatever, they want their money back, first and foremost, then they want an acceptable percentage on the top of that. How they get that, by either selling shares or by you just giving them a revenue share or anything like that, um, the devil's in the details. It's entirely up to you, and it depends on the investor what sort of thing they're after at any particular time. Um, but it, it literally comes down to cash. They will invest in you if they see a way of getting their money back, and then some. Yeah? And, and it won't matter to them how they have to do that. Also, uh, a quick follow-up. I was just thinking about uh, games like uh, Candy Crush and stuff like that, <laughs> which are basically rehashings of old Bejeweled games and stuff like that. And Be I'm the thinking, best. <laughs> the best. And I'm thinking, is that uh, kind of a clever way of um, uh, like distributing or making games that are basically the same game as the old one, but it's just reskinned and <coughs> got a new name, and then you sell it to the new player base that don't have any memories of Bejeweled at mm -hmm. all. Uh, it is obviously a very valid tactic because Candy Crush is the most successful video game of, you know, it, it, the, the amount of money that they still make, like week on week, is insane. Um, I'll ask you a question. Why do you want to get into video games? Why, why do you want to make video games? To inspire. To inspire? Yeah. So it doesn't matter about the money? Not really, no. No. <laughs> So you probably wouldn't just take an existing game and rip it off God, and try... No. Exactly. So, so there you go. And so as far as I'm concerned, you, sir, I'm going to shake your hand. But as far as I'm concerned, the, there's people who make games because they want to make games. They want others to play the games. They want the others to feel the emotion that they have when they play the games. That's their reward. I, I always think that the, the, the biggest payoff you can get is when you walk into one of these soon-to-be-closed retailers uh, and your game is on the soon-to-be-empty shelf and this little kid comes up and takes your game off the shelf and goes to his friend, buy this, it's really good. If I could eat that... And, I did, and, and that could pay my rent, that would be brilliant, that's all I would ever need, okay? Unfortunately, you've got to make money. And then there are those who have seen how big the industry has become, how lucrative the industry has become, and their sole purpose is to make money. And from a pure business sense, this is a great way of doing it. This is absolutely a great way of doing it. But I'm not a fan of those. For me, for me personally, that's the wrong reason to get into games. Um, and I would kind of class them under the D word earlier. <laughs> Thank you. But not you, sir. You, sir. You've got the right idea as far as I'm concerned. Ernest, you had a... Uh, just very quickly. Um, I just uh, wanted to add to your point about how do you become a game designer. Um, uh, the, uh, it, it, as an indie, you become a game designer by saying you're a game designer. Yeah. And you, know, you might succeed or fail, but that's, what, that's all you have to do. Um, in an employment environment, what I did... Um, because I was a programmer, is that I um, took somebody else's game design that I was programming, and I wrote a lot of comments on it, and said, I think this could be improved here, 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 and here. And the producer said, hmm, you seem to know what you're doing. How about you stop being a programmer and become a game designer? So the short answer is, do the design job before anybody lets you, <laughs> before anybody pays you. You just have to do two jobs at once for a while, hmm. Um, and in fact, that's pretty much how you get promoted at, at, anyway in the game industry. You know, mm. you, you do the job you're being paid to do, and you do another job at the same time, um, and and hope that somebody notices. And you know, in my case, they did. Yeah, I, so, I, I, I agree. I agree fully. So the the single pro biggest problem with the uh, "Hey, I'm a game designer" uh, thing is proof. You need to be able to prove it, and it is one of the single hardest things to prove. For people to realize, like, uh, if an artist wants to prove he's a good artist, he will draw you a picture, or he will make you a model, or he will do whatever, and you will look at it, and you'll go, that's good, or that's bad, or I like the way you've done this. And you can instantly tell, there's his proof. For a coder, did it crash? No, you're a good coder. <laughs> yeah? For a designer, I've got this idea. It's a weasel with a gun. Is that good? Uh, it's interesting. How do we know it's good? And unfortunately, the only way you know it's good is when you get the programmer to write how the weasel works and how the gun fires, and when you get the artist to, to make the weasel all move and have his all fur and, and blood splats coming out when he gets hit by the gun. And that is a lot of work to put in before you've proved whether you're good or not. So, by coming in and 
and being able to demonstrate that you know the principles of it. Hang on, this is a bad de design decision for these reasons. This would be a more interesting design decision for those. Uh, that's uh, short of being able to sit down and do it yourself. Now, again, as a programmer, as a former programmer, you've got the best of both worlds. If you're a programmer and you're a designer, that's fantastic because, quite frankly, you sit down and you write it. It is so much better, so much better to show someone the game and let them play it and decide for themselves whether it's any good rather than just, no matter how vigorously you wave your hands or wave bits of paper saying, look at this wonderful design, they're not going to know until they actually get their hands on it. So if you can do the stuff yourself, which, by the way, Unity <laughs> makes it really, really easy to do, even if you've got no coding experience at all. I can't stress enough how simple it is for everyone to just be able to pick it up and start using. Um, so if you can show rather than tell, yeah, so much more powerful. That also, incidentally, applies to uh, pitches. You rock up at one of these pitches with a, a single image and uh, a handout. No, show me, sh give me the controller, let me play it. Uh, if you can't do that, give me a video showing someone else playing it. Yeah? Um, it the, 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 the showing is so much more powerful than the, trust me, this is going to be a really good game. Yeah. Anyway, I think, are we all right for time? Yeah? Or oh, we got one more? It's just I can't be still once I get something in my head, I have to say. With the Candy Crush thing, I had avoided it like the plague because I don't play the casual Facebook, put your money and all that grab your time stuff until I went to Join Game and saw who was playing Candy Crush. And they were the, some of the most elite designers I'm, I've ever met. So I started playing it to find out why the heck. And what I found out is, yeah, they took and started with something like Bedazzled, or Bejeweled, or whatever that thing's called. Yeah. Bejeweled. But they have taken that simple idea and and embroidered it and expanded it and balanced it to where they tempt me to put real money after I've failed at the same one for so, so many days in a row after. Okay, but there you go. I think there, there you're touching on why it's Candy Crush exists. so be beautifully. And there's a lot of craftsmanship that has gone into that simple, ugly, has an ugly yes. skin. Quite frankly, it has a horrific story. Who gives a care about Gingerbread Valley or whatever? But, but there you have it. I mean, what you've touched balanced. on is as, as an exercise in balancing, that game is phenomenal. But it's as an exercise in balancing how much money they can extract for you, not balancing how much fun you have. That game relies on compulsion mechanics, not fun. It, re it relies on the fact that actually your friend has just beaten your score. And what do you mean you can't get past this level? Oh, you were that close that time. You were so close to the line. Maybe if you just gave us a little bit of money, we could push you over the line. It's so many of those just tantalizing little things. And it's, it's balanced to such a degree that you'll reach a certain point and you'll have to start paying because otherwise you're just not going to be competitive. And no one likes to lose. No one likes to lose. So the fact that this game is kind of beating them and kind of goading them along, but it's not. Whenever you're going to beat someone at a game, the trick is beat them by all means, but always give them hope. If you don't give me, who's seen the film Rounders? Okay. It's a very good poker film, very good poker film. And there's two guys, and one guy insists, no, you beat them, you beat them hollow, take their money and leave. And the other guy says, but if we only beat them a little bit and make them think that they had a chance, they'll come back and we can beat them again and take even more money. Yeah? That's what Candy Crush is. Candy Crush is the second guy who's like, oh, you were so close. A little bit more money. But as a game designer, I've designed my own game. And that is to beat Candy Crush without putting money down. <laughs> that, and, and to be fair, that's, the, that's exactly the way I play as well. That's exactly the way I play. If I get a better score, I just yeah. say, oh, well, they probably paid money. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. <laughs>